Hello, how are you doing? Well, Willie, I'm uh, absolutely fantastic. Now, we've just been having a, a quick wee thumb through the programme, but we'll go to that in time. Uh, OK, if we can go back to the uh, very, very early days, uh, your first interest in motorcycling. The uh, Lowman Club started, I got involved with the Lowman Club when I would be about 16 years old, and they had close to club scrambles, so that really started me off. That's, I mean, that's my apprenticeship, you could say. On seeing that, Willie, did, did you did you get into the competition sort of side of things before you ever had a road bike or anything like that? I never had a road bike really at all. I just started straight away in the competition side of things. So what what would have made you? Who was your uh, who would you say was your icons? Who were you idolising in these early early years? Going to these events, or can you remember any of the names that were in the program? I don't really remember many names in the program. No. No. Okay, Loch Lomond, Loch Lomond, a club that still exists. It's quite unusual because they, uh, not really that many years ago, Loch Lomond still managed to even have their own, their own club rooms, but I know that they, uh, they still have the Loch Lomond two-day trial, which is a, uh, well, a pretty prestigious event as far as the trials were all concerned, but uh, uh, quite a number of famous names in the, in the, in the Loch Lomond club. From these very, very early years, what would have been your first competition bike, and how much did it cost? My first competition bike which was a Greaves Hoxton and I bought it in a box for £35. <laughs> so who would you buy it from and what sort of condition? Uh, you said it was in a box. Uh, obviously, who helped you put it together then? I bought it from Jimmy Ferguson who's um, Mickey Oates Motorcycles now in Glasgow and Jimmy stayed in the same village as me so I, said, I would say Jimmy Ferguson got me quite involved in the motocross scene. Well, Jimmy is uh, still very, very much to the fore. Tries to uh, attend as many, as many meetings and as many events as possible, but uh, I know the sons are running the shop through there, uh, Clydeside, Port Glasgow, Port Dundas area. Uh, but uh, a, fair, a fair hive of activity through there. Anyway, that first machine, you've got her back together again. Did you get assistance to do this, or who was helping you? Jimmy Ferguson gave me quite a lot of hand, put it together and got all the bits that I needed. And then I raced that for about a year and then I uh, bought a MDS and other Greaves. And I raced that for a while as well. I kind of just remember after that. Quite a, quite a few things that the uh, Greaves were making, really right up through their, uh, through their lifetime, were, were based on various circuits. Now whether it be something like a a, a, a Greaves Anglian or a, a Greaves Scottish or a, a, a Hawkstone, a Silverstone, uh, just an Alton and an, another bit that comes to mind. But what would have been the big, big difference from that Hawkstone to your next machine, which you tell us was an MDS? Very little, a square barrel. <laughs> not much, power wise, not much difference at all. So uh, still sticking with, 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 the, with the 250s. As far as maintenance was concerned at that time, did you have to put your hand in, in your pocket a lot to keep it running? Every week, it was, you had to strip them every week and rebuild them just about every week, putting rings every week and seals them just to keep them going. Terrible things. Well, if, if rings was the main thing, uh, obviously the, uh, you've got the mixture set absolutely fantastic, so you've not got any, uh, <laughs> any leakage on the ground of the pistons, but you keep your compression up when you put new rings in it, that's guaranteed. Meetings as far as going to different venues concerned, where were you travelling? The first year I just travelled kind of locally and then I seemed to get involved and go down to North England quite a lot. And then there were a lot of grass tracks up in Fife, around about the Forfar area. So we tend to go to them on a Saturday and use the, use the grass tracks as a like practice session for the race meeting on the Sunday. How did that compare, or did they have different classes for, for uh, scrambles machines uh, as well as mixing it with the guys that were going pure sideways? They just had the same class, so you were up against the grass trackers. So the grass tracks would, as soon as they got to the corner, they would pass you, and then you would, if you could keep the inside, you could squirt up the straight and maybe, you know, do it okay. But most of the time, the grass trackers could beat us okay. One of the things that's coming to mind, how many, uh, how many grass track machines, well, how many machines really would have been on the line at that time and how many laps in the race? 
Um, maybe about 15 laps and there might be 20 machines in the line at a time. So it's very difficult to say. They were very much class, you know, the, a lot of four strokes, two strokes were really just starting to come in, you know, that would be 65, 66, 65 really, two strokes were really getting going. And there were a lot of four strokes, so it really went against the four strokes, but the four strokes were allowed to race you know, in the bigger classes as well, so you had a disadvantage against the four strokes. They were a lot quicker than the two strokes, but the two strokes were nice and light. One of the things that's coming to mind, uh, I was talking to somebody about this this morning, and it was a uh, petrol mixture. What sort of mixture were you putting in the greaves at that particular time? I'm not going to be giving away any uh, any any stories or porky pies, but the, uh, we're just talking about the, the oil and petrol mixture or content uh, just to keep the top end loop. I don't remember. What? <laughs> what, what do I know? Like? I, I was talking to Peter Robertson this morning and he was talking about his, uh, his standard TZ Yamaha, which might have been either a 250 or a 350. And he was talking about, he said it should have been 15 to 1. But he decided to make his 20, uh, just to make it just that wee bit, give it a wee bit extra loop, just to try and stop it to, uh, nipping up. So do you think it might have been about the same? It may have been the same, difficult to say, I don't remember. The 250s never really seized up, but the 360 could seize up because the twin boat was very close to each other, so the, the pistons would seize between the boats. So you tend, you just bore a hole in the piston to let it lubricate that between the ports. Was there a, a big difference between the, 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 the single port and the twin port then? I know a, a bigger capacity, but uh, it's, is it strange that they never ever did a, a, a twin port 250? I don't know. I don't know. Factory never said. So, you just mentioned factory there. Where were you getting your spare parts to keep the uh, get the machine going? And you're talking about, well, one of the obvious things was uh, piston rings. Um, I think most of the stuff came from the factory at latter time. Because the factory had helped to sponsor me, you know, after I was 68, they, they, they helped to sponsor me, they gave me all the bits that I needed. So if I phoned them up, they would just send everything that I needed. As far as the, uh, the 250, two-stroke class was concerned, uh, obviously uh, the, the, the Greaves was definitely reigning supreme. And a lot of really, really quick guys were on these bikes. Uh, you can maybe name some of the names. I know a lot of them, but I uh, know a lot of names will come to your mind as well. Vic Allen, Jimmy Hurt, Gordon Mason was, wasn't very far away, and there were quite a lot of from North England. Norman Barrow, Norman was always up with us. And then Norman moved on to CCMs, and I gave up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't really say, say that was the case. As far as as far as Greaves were concerned, uh, did, did you move? What machine did you move to after that? Because then you've just touched on it, saying that the uh, the CCM started to rule the roost. The CCMs only started to rule the roost in six, that be sixty nine seventy when CCMs really got going. I think that's when Clues bought it, and I I really given up in seventy. I stopped racing in nineteen seventy. I'm just thinking the, uh, the, the likes of people like, uh, well, Jimmy Ed was up there, Bickers was up there, and, and all these guys, Peter Reid, uh, Nori uh, Lindbergh, and all these guys. It just seemed to be the thing. Uh, Ernie Page. Well, yeah. Ernie Page was, he was never far away. Ernie was really good at the trials and the enduro stuff. So Ernie really was a hard man to beat. He never tired out, Ernie, you know. Dare I uh, d delve into your pocket here? As I say, we've got Wally Wallace, our guest of honour here, and Wally will be uh, performing our, our uh, presentation ceremony later on. Go and take your programme back out of your pocket again, Wally, and you've shown us one of the pictures here that you've uh, delved into your own personal archives, and you, you managed to, uh, to picture or, or mention a few names, and uh, we'll just go to page number three in the programme, and you can picture a, or name quite a few of the riders in that show. Well, I'm leading the race, Jimmy Ed's second, and then to the right of that is Peter Reed, then Charlie Robertson, just uh, that would be Jimmy Ed's elbow, I don't know the riders, then Gordon Mason's behind that, and right to the left hand side is it Lot Ian Mackay, and he would be the Husky as well, I don't, I don't know some of the other riders.
I'm just thinking, the, uh, as, as far as your leaves was concerned, uh, do you think you had went as far as you had wanted to go? Um, I think it went as far as I could go. <laughs> I don't know things, so I gave it up and then I came back to the classics and roughly ten years ago and I enjoyed the classics. I enjoy the scene, you know, it's it's just it's a disease. Motorbikes are a disease, so you enjoy the you enjoy the atmosphere, you love to win, but nobody, everybody can't win, so just enjoy the kind of scene and the sport, so I really enjoy that. So I miss, I miss that side, I'm too old to do it anymore. One of the things that comes to mind, just when you're saying that, I don't really want to be uh, embarrassing you or picking your brains, uh, what made you want to uh, hang up your helmet then? Old age. <laughs> no, <laughs> originally, when you, when you were at the top of your game. I don't know. I don't know. I just decided that I wasn't getting any. It wasn't really progressing. I progressed as far as I could get in Scotland. So the next move would to follow um, Pick Allen and Jimmy Reid, uh, Jimmy Ayrton, and go down south. And I just didn't fancy doing that. Did you ever venture, uh, say, well, just say the likes of the North of England? Because I mean that was a pretty hot hive as well. Well, we down to the Cumberland. There were quite a lot of meetings there, and we're down to Pickering. Then we travelled with Jimmy Aird and Jimmy and me went way down to Yeovil and Somerset and Chard. Then we met up with uh, Jimmy Stewart and Jimmy Stewart was racing Cheney BSAs for Cheney at the time. So we met up with Jimmy and we raced quite a few metres down there. We didn't really, we managed to get maybe in the middle of the field, you know, 6th, 10th place or something like that. But that was the best we could do because it was pretty hard competition down there, you know, the Rickman brothers. They were, they were in the scene at that time, so it was pretty hard going down south, uh, Badger Goss, so it was, it was pretty hard to win down, uh, down south. A lot of, uh, a lot